Oh, hello, everyone. Um, I'll, turn my, I'll turn my camera off. I'm one of the kidney specialist nurses from, uh, I'm based at Royal Preston Hospital in Lancashire. And um, my background is a dialysis nurse. Um, and um, I've, I've been in my current role, which as you might guess from my title, is I help people to make choices about um, treatments for chronic kidney disease. I'm just trying to uh, move my presentation on and it's not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, right, okay. So um, obviously when people are um, living with reduced kidney function, um, there comes a time when most people need to make some decisions about their treatments. Um, generally, um, GPs don't refer people to see a hospital kidney specialist until your kidney function is less than 30%. But obviously there are a lot of people on the call today who may be taking tolvaptin, and um, you know, obviously they're under the supervision of a kidney specialist for uh, at a much earlier stage than people who have um, chronic kidney disease. And obviously there are hundreds of different reasons why people's kidneys um, don't work as well as we'd like them to. Um, I just want to say as well, um, I, I often say this to people when I first meet them, that most people don't need to start dialysis until their kidney function is between five and 10%. And I have seen people who've lived with very low kidney function, five to 6% um, for a number of years sometimes um, without dialysis um, because their quality of life is such that they, you know, they don't feel the need to start dialysis. Um, and you know, some people can live very well with few symptoms even if their kidney function is very low, but obviously everyone is different. Um, Judging from the questions I've seen on the call so far, um, there's a lot of people with a massive amount of knowledge about their condition, which is wonderful. Um, but I'm pitching this, if I'm pitching this too simply, I apologise. But I just thought that there might be some people on the call who are very new to this. And um, jargon is a, a, sometimes a foreign language to some people. So GFR is glomerular filtration rate, and that's, we usually say that it's a fancy way of saying percentage kidney function. Um, and a lot of people um, wonder, you know, what, what GFR means, and, you know, that, that's the first thing I tell them. Um, and then I've got all these blood test results, and I really don't know, should I be worried? Um, so it, it's, it's, it can be a minefield. And some people want to know lots of things. Other people don't want to know anything. And they only, need, they only want information on a need to know basis. So judging by you know, what we're doing today, a lot of people on the call are you know, wanting to know information. Um, but as I say, I, I deal with a lot of people who don't want much at all. But when we're looking at blood test results, potassium, the chemical symbol is K, um, that's a mineral in the blood that needs to be normal for the heart rhythm to be normal. And um, when, when your kidneys don't work as well as we want them to, um, sometimes there's a risk that the potassium level can become high. And if people are taking drugs like Ramapril or Candesartan, those ACE inhibitors and um, you know, those Prills and Artan drugs, um, they do um, there, there is a risk, one of the side effects of those tablets to control blood pressure is that the potassium level in the blood does become higher. So often patients are advised um, to limit their dietary intake of potassium. And um, it's best to do that from a point, you know, with, in conjunction with a renal dietitian, uh, because general, high, you know, low potassium diet advice is not always helpful for everyone because for somebody who perhaps doesn't eat a great deal of fruit and vegetables, for example, and there are quite a few people who don't, um, you know, it, it's amazing really that, you know, that information needs to be tailored to individuals and um, so that if the dietitian knows what you typically eat, they'll be able to advise you about your diet specifically. Um, Creatinine comes from the breakdown of protein in the body and all the things that our body does to keep us alive, our whole metabolism is generating toxins every minute of every day. And um, 
the higher the creatinine, the lower the GFR. So the higher the creatinine is toxin in the blood, um, the lower the, the percentage kidney function. And creatinine, um, the, the, the top level is about 120. That's usually for men. Um, it's a bit slightly higher in men because they have a bit more muscle um, usually than women. Uh, and elite athletes can look like they've got um, a bit of kidney disease because their creatinines are so high. And that's usually because they have massive amounts of muscle. And if they're doing hard training and elite training, um, it's not unusual to see, um, you know, they've got normal kidney function, but judging from their blood tests, if they were having them, it would look like perhaps they didn't have quite normal kidney function. The other thing that we look for in blood test results um, at an early stage is the haemoglobin, which is a basic measurement of red blood cells. And when people's kidneys don't work as well, lots of people know that the kidneys clean the blood and get rid of fluid. They're not always so aware that the kidneys have a, a massive role to play in keeping us from being anemic. And when kidneys start to fail and get worse, uh, anemia is usually a big problem. Um, Again, the normal range varies. Um, in fact, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head accurately what it is for women and what it's a little bit lower. Um, but as kidney specialists, their, their aim is to keep the red blood cell count between 100 and 120. And if yours is higher than 120 without any treatment, that's absolutely fine. Um, but when you're on treatment for anemia, then um, we usually begin that when the red blood cell count, the haemoglobin is below 100. Um, but if it's, you know, and our aim once you're on treatment is to keep it between 100 and 120. Because if we try and put it up to say 140, which is normal range for men with normal kidney function, uh, we risk losing control of blood pressure, uh, which is obviously not what we want to do. Um, and that puts people at increased risk of stroke and things like that, which is obviously not what we're into at all. Um, there are many more blood tests to think about. And I think the, the thing to say is that um, if you access your own blood results through a, a, a platform like Renal Patient View, which your kidney specialist can sort out for you, um, there's lots of information when you are accessing your results. And I think the more you start to look at your results and look at the trend of your um, blood test results, um, that often helps to understand your own results better and obviously helps you to be better informed about your kidney function then. So moving on to symptoms, um, obviously these have been discussed a little bit already um, with, um, you know, by Dr. Power. Um, and tiredness is a massive thing that a lot of people who are coming to see somebody like myself um, would talk about. Um, and yeah, I think he talked about it very well when he said that people um, have this tendency to nod off, especially in the afternoons. Um, a lot of people I talk to who are working full time, balancing, you know, full time work with families, often elderly parents and, you know, children living at home. Um, you know, having, a, you know, being tired is obviously a massive problem and possibly you know, they, they become depend, more dependent on a, a partner, giving them support for things. Uh, people who live alone, you know, obviously increased tiredness, low energy levels, who haven't got any immediate social support. It's much more of a problem than it is for people who perhaps live with somebody who's very supportive. Um, there's also a degree of um, ignorance, really, on the part of people whose kidney function is normal because they find it extremely um, hard to understand how bad some people feel some days, uh, but they don't actually look ill. Uh, well, you don't look well, you know, you don't, you don't look so ill. So, you know, and there, there, there's sometimes a lot of tension within uh, the family because of just a lack of awareness, really. Um, when people's kidney function gets below 20, that's when we usually start to see symptoms, but mainly the symptoms that are on this slide now uh, become more of a problem on a regular basis um, and perhaps people have sort of like identified with two or three of them when their kidney function goes below 15%. Um, and obviously there's some quite awful ones there really. We have some people who really struggle with sickness, um, 
you know, they feel nauseated. A lot of people, um, a lot of women say that they feel like they did if they suffered with um, morning sickness during pregnancy. We often have a lot of people who say, I can't face food till about two o'clock in the, in the afternoon um, and then I can eat normally. And they're able to maintain their weight. But if you're having lots of problems with nausea and vomiting, and obviously from this audience, with people with polycystic kidneys, if they are struggling with you know, very large cysts and very large kidneys and cysts in the liver that are causing the, the types of symptoms that Dr. Power talked about, um, you know, then obviously that's different to the nausea and vomiting that I'm talking about here in terms of um, your, what we call uremic symptoms where the urea and the creatinine is starting to get higher because the kidneys aren't filtering them out. Itching can be an awful problem for some people and some people get absolutely driven mad by um, really awful itching when, when the toxins get higher. Um, sometimes sorting out things like phosphate, which I didn't talk about in my previous slide, sometimes phosphate being high can cause very bad itching. And um, a lot of people do report reduced um, urine output, which obviously is a higher up the slide that I, didn't, I missed on before. But a lot of people with polycystic kidneys don't tend to lose the ability to pass urine. They still produce um, urine and don't tend to need as much in the way of fluid uh, restrictions, because if you don't pass a lot of urine, and some people don't, um, they obviously have to restrict how much fluid do they drink in a day, which can be very difficult, because when you've got altered blood chemistry, because the toxins are higher, you feel more thirsty than people who have normal kidney function, and you know it is extremely difficult to limit your fluid um, when, when you're feeling very thirsty. And what, what, doc, you know, what Dr. Anand was talking about in the previous slide about the salt, you know, we always say you'll, if you're on a fluid restriction, you'll never, ever control your thirst if you're packing salt into your diet. So that's another reason not to um, have too much salt. And sometimes people start feeling a bit short of breath uh, because of fluid retention in the lungs um, if they're not passing as much urine. And they also start feeling short of breath, sometimes because of anemia, but also sometimes because the acidity levels in the blood start to become higher. And that's um, a blood, on a blood test called bicarbonate. And when the bicarbonate level in the blood falls to about below 20, we ask people to take sodium bicarbonate capsules to increase the level of bicarbonate in the blood, which is an alkali, which um, neutralizes to some degree the acidity that's produced because the kidneys aren't working very well. And um, that does help with the breathlessness, but sodium bicarbonate is baking powder and it can cause people to have um, a lot of um, flatulence. So they burp a lot more and they fart a lot more and it can really be very embarrassing for some people and other people just don't notice any side effects whatsoever. So it's, it's very, um, it's very variable. Um, I'm not really going to talk about anemia anymore um, because we've kind of talked about it already. And obviously when people start to be, you know, when they start, when, when the nephrologists at our place then start to ask, though, have you seen the kidney choices team? That's when people's anxiety levels start to go through the roof. Um, because living with a, a condition, you know, like kidney disease is obviously, there's a lot of fear about the future um, and a lot of uncertainty and living with uncertainty is a very, you know, we've touched on it already in the last um, talk about the genetics. Um, you know, some people live very well with uncertainty, but a lot of people don't. Um, so I just lifted this slide from um, one of the um, booklets that we give out to our patients. Um, so stage one and two, um, you know, normally people who didn't have polycystic kidney disease would not be anywhere near a hospital clinic um, at this stage. It would really only be people who were leaking a lot of protein in their urine or people who were, you know, with polycystic kidneys who were, who were taking tolvaptan. Um, I'm not an expert on tolvaptan at all because most people that I see are in stage four and five um, kidney disease. And, you know, listening to some of the questions on this call so far, 
Um, you know, I've, I've learned a lot myself about polycystic kidney disease today. Um, I'm not an expert. It, it's it's a, a field of, you know, we, we see a few people with polycystic kidneys, but a lot of people that I see, they're diabetic and they've got high blood pressure and they've got some of the other kidney diseases that were alluded to in the other talks. Um, stage three is really um, when people's, when GPs start to refer patients into, um, into a service, you know, in a, a, a renal hospital service, um, particularly if they're starting to leak protein in the urine. Because if your kidney filter goes a bit wrong, uh, what happens is that um, the, the, the damage to the kidney is, is accelerated and the progression tends to be faster, the progression to end-stage kidney disease where you need to start thinking about transplant and dialysis. Um, so the, the, that's, that's, that's just a little bit about stages. Um, a bit more, a little bit about that, which just, um, I'll go on to stage four for just the, the purposes of saving a bit of time. Um, this is when most people um, start to see a kidney consultant when their kidney function is less than 30%. And usually they start to think about um, planning for future renal replacement therapy, RRT, which is another love abbreviation that health professionals love to use to confuse everybody. Um, and planning for transplant then starts to happen when the GFR, the percentage of kidney function, is around 20 to 25. Um, and stage five is when we, when the kidney function is less than 15, we really need to you know, start planning for dialysis. Most people get referred to somebody like me when their kidney function is around 20%. And you know, often um, we're talking more about transplantation in the first instance rather than dialysis. Um, so obviously if your kidney function is pretty reasonable, um, we'd be looking at a yearly blood test um, as, as a minimum to check your kidney function, the GFR, uh, and a urine test to determine whether you leak protein in the urine and albumin to assess for albumin creatinine ratio. Um, and obviously these tests are done if you're, you know, if you're already known to your GP, you've been through a lot of genetic testing, you know, you've got a diagnosis, uh, these things would probably be happening, but it's always best to check. Um, urine dipsticks that we do um, in hospitals are not an accurate um, uh, measurement of protein leak at all. And, um, you know, some people leak a lot of protein in the urine and you can usually see that by the urine looks frothy, like a head of beer uh, in the loo. Some people don't even look down the loo when they, you know, when they wee. So, you know, it just, everybody's different. Um, and obviously if you're, you know, if you're taking, if you've been taking Telvaptan for a long time, um, you're probably known to a kidney specialist far earlier than if you're, um, you know, if, if you've not been doing that. Um, and as uh, Dr. Power talked about, the control of blood pressure is so important. Um, we say um, that the, you know, the, the Renal Association says that blood pressure should be no higher than 140 over 90. And that is for people um, who are, um, you know, that, that's all time blood pressure. That's for people who are older, who have diabetes, who have heart disease, who have lung disease, you know, for, for your audience, we'd be talking much lower. And like Dr. Power said, you know, 120 over 75 uh, or 130 over 80 is, is definitely what we should be aiming for. Um, and the blood pressure medication for, you know, for people with polycystic kidneys would be introduced much earlier than it would be for somebody who was older with diabetes and some degree of um, heart problems and circulatory problems. So people are starting to come to the clinic a little bit more frequently. Um, can I, I'm sorry, can I just jump in yeah. here? Uh, someone's asking, is ACR a 24-hour yeah. urine test? No, um, it doesn't need to be. Um, we, we, to be honest, we don't use it, ACRs very much um, in hospitals. We use protein creatinine ratios, which are PCRs to detect protein. Um, and to be honest, um, it, 
ACR by hospital doctors is not done much because they're, they're more interested in the PCRs. Now, don't ask me what the, dif what the, what the difference is, but we, we tend to look at PCRs in um, hospital. Um, there are some 24-hour uh, um, tests that are more accurate, um, but usually an ACR is, can just be done off one sample, um, as far as I know. Um, we wouldn't necessarily need to be, um, you know, if, if you've got not a great deal of protein in the urine to start with, um, as time goes on, that could increase. Um, but the Ramapril and the Candesartan type drugs do give your kidney um, filter system a little protection against protein leaks. Uh, and that's why we like people to be on them because they've got a added bonus of giving the kidney some protection against protein leak because if you've got a very high level of lots of protein leaking through kidneys and, and you're not on Ramapril or Candesartan or some such tip, similar drug, um, your kidneys will fail quicker and that those drugs tend to be the ones that we like people to be on because they give that filter system protection and hopefully slow down the rate at which you lose your kidney function. Thanks, Dan. So by the time that you're stage five, um, less than 15%, you're usually coming to clinics sort of, you know, anything between about six weeks and three months, um, particularly if your kidney function is getting, you know, be, be getting worse with every blood test, which is when people start to get really worried. Um, and by this time, they, you've usually met somebody like me a few times and talked about options, which I'm going to go on to. Um, and obviously, when you've got polycystic kidneys and perhaps you're, um, you, you have a lot of pain and you're found to have a, you know, a urine infection or a kidney infection because one of the cysts has become infected, or you've got obvious blood in the urine and lots of pain and you know, one of the cysts has burst, any, any time around that that you have your blood test done, you could almost guarantee that your kidney function bloods would look worse. Because any kind of infection, even a common cold or something like that, you know, if you have your blood test done and you're full of a cold, again, you can see, we, we see sometimes a 5% difference um, in GF, you know, 5 mil difference in GFR. So if your baseline GFR is 20, um, you know, and you have a cold, you know, it could go down to 15 and then people start panicking. But once they get over the cold, sometimes, you know, sometimes the, the kidney function stays a little bit less but often it jumps back to baseline again, you know, panic over. Um, and by this stage, you are more likely to be on uh, medication for blood pressure. You're also likely to be on a statin to cut cardiovascular risk. Um, and um, you might need to start anemia treatment, which might be um, an infusion of iron. Some people do take iron tablets, but often people don't tolerate them well. They cause horrible bouts of constipation, diarrhea, stomach cramps. Uh, and giving iron as a drip, um, which is an infusion given over half an hour the first time and about 15 minutes subsequent times. Um, it's a quick appointment and you probably wouldn't need more than a couple of those a year. Um, if, you're, if you've had iron and we've, we've given you plenty of iron, topped your iron levels up in your body, um, kidneys make a hormone that tell the bone marrow in the thigh bone to make their blood cells. And if you've got loads of iron, the, and there's enough kidney function left that the kidneys are still able to do that, then brilliant. Um, but if you're needing EPO treatment, which is RNSP, usually erythropoietin, um, which is the hormone that healthy kidneys make, that's usually given as an injection under the skin on a fortnightly to monthly basis. And then obviously we'll be talking about transplants, um, can be from a live donor or a deceased donor. Um, and obviously trying to talk about dialysis options if it's not looking likely that you can have a live donor. And obviously, you know, we, we know people with polycystic kidneys whose whole families are known to our renal service. And for them often, you know, their, their, their possibilities of a live donor are less because other members of their family also suffer from the same condition. And obviously, anxiety levels can start to be very high. So, um, and just sorry to jump in. There's a, I think you may have missed um, stage four. 
Right, okay. <laughs> There's, um, quite, there's quite a few people here demanding yeah, stage yeah, four. Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, stage four is you're usually going to see a kidney consultant, which is, an, you know, the, the blood pressure would be, blood pressure control would be crucial. Uh, you probably wouldn't need much in the way of anemia treatment, unless, of course, you've um, suffered a big blood loss from, say, a burst cyst or something like that. Um, and... You know, for people who are going to, you know, at some point need renal replacement therapy, which is transplant and dialysis, um, we, you know, we don't normally give people any blood transfusions or anything like that if they were to lose a lot of blood, which, you know, isn't common, but, you know, isn't, isn't you know, beyond the realms of possibility. Um you know, if you if you do suffer a lot with pain and burst cysts and have hospital admissions through that, um, you know, always um, discuss with your doctors about transfusions because the more transfusions you have, the more antibodies you make, and then transplant in the future may become a little bit more challenging. But on the other hand, if you've had a devastating bleed from a cyst and lost a lot of blood, you need, you know, sometimes you do need a blood transfusion very quickly. Um, but stage four, you're generally coming to clinic possibly once every three or four months. Your blood pressure is, um, you know, hopefully being well controlled with medication. Um, some people don't need medication. Some people have no problem with their blood pressure. Um, but obviously, with blood pressure, um, we've talked about, you know, monitoring at home and things like that. A lot of people... I wouldn't say need to do it every day. I would say that if, you know, once a week, once a couple, once a couple of times a month, particularly if you're not taking any medication, um, I would only do it that, you know, as frequently as once a week or once a month, a couple of times a month, because um, you can get a bit hung up about blood pressure and sometimes that makes things worse. Um, and again, the advice that Dr. Alan gave about, you know, maintaining a healthy weight or the, you know, the balanced diet, the uh, low salt, um, you know, exercise, you know, regular walks, things like that. Those are the sort of things that we'd be recommending at that stage. Um, and as I say, you probably only be seeing your hospital consultant probably every three or four months. And you don't need to have loads of blood tests either. A lot of GPs start doing blood tests every month and you think, well, that's you know, that's if your kidney function is dropping, you know, and every, say like it starts at 20 and then next test it's 15 and then it's 10. Obviously, you would need more frequent blood tests. But if your kidney functions, you know, um, fairly stable, there's no need to do blood tests every couple of weeks or anything like that. And people just normally have them done a week before they see their hospital consultant. Does that answer the questions? think so yes that's good okay. thanks Anne. so i'm just aware of time now because i think yes i'm just thinking you um so stacking up so yeah um, yeah transplant um is something that we always think of first and i want to make it clear to people that you don't have to be on dialysis to have a transplant we want to do a preemptive transplant which is always about um trying to get you transplanted before you even experience dialysis and that's that runs alongside um, planning for dialysis, uh, but it really should be planning for transplant first. And obviously remember that the people, a lot of people that I see are elderly over 65, they've got heart problems, they've got diabetes, they've, you know, they've got circulatory disease. Um, and those are the things that have caused their kidney, kidneys to fail in the first place. A lot of them aren't suitable for a transplant, but we do transplant people you know, up until the age of maybe 75. Um, so th there's lots to consider. Um, we have a transplant team and they would take forward the, the, the tests for things like that. Uh, and obviously a live donation team who we would put people in touch with if they've got um, potential live donors. Um, but there's essentially, um, you know, while we try and get people transplanted where we can, uh, sometimes we don't actually get them transplanted in time because um, the average wait time for a kidney from the deceased donor list, so if you're on the transplant list waiting for a kidney from a, somebody who's died, 
um, average wait time in the UK at the moment is between three and five years. And your kidneys may well have got to the point where you need some dialysis in order to stay in reasonably good health to be on the transplant list in the first place, because we can't transplant you if you're ill. Um, so people need dialysis, and this is what dialysis was um, invented for, was in, you know when it first started in the 70s, it was brought in to actually keep people alive whilst you know whilst we sorted out a transplant for them. And there's hemodialysis, which is usually called the blood dialysis or peritoneal dialysis, which is a tube in the abdomen. Um, and it can, um, they both can be done at home or in hospital. Um, but peritoneal dialysis is a home treatment and hemodialysis, most people who are on that tend to go to a hospital unit, but people do do it at home. Um, but if you've got polycystic kidneys, sometimes if your kidneys are so large that they're taking up so much space in the abdomen, that sometimes means that people need to have the kidneys removed before they're transplanted. Um, and if your kidneys are very large, there's only a certain amount of space within the abdomen, and it could be that peritoneal dialysis may not be suitable. But don't ever rule that out until, you know, but it's something to discuss with your kidney specialist. There's a very simplified diagram here of dialysis, um, and um, this is the machine here. Um, people usually have a fistula made in their arm where we join an artery and a vein together, and we put two needles into this specially created blood vessel, um, which is usually done a few months before people need to start when the kidney function is around 10 to 12 percent, if they're going to have this type of dialysis, and we have a one needle that takes the blood to the filter where all the toxins and fluid are removed and then high, a second needle higher up the arm takes the clean blood back to the patient and then it goes around the whole body again picks up more blood and it just circulates in a continual um, continuous way. People tend to need uh, treatment three times a week um, roughly every alternate day uh, and you get a set day if you do it in hospital. If you're doing it at home, you would have a much smaller machine, which would be able to, and, and lots of people who do dialysis at home do it for um, four or five times a week, but for sh a slightly shorter time. And there's hundreds of different, um, you know, regimes that you could follow, um, but that's a simplified version of hemodialysis. Um, we, if, we, if your kidneys failed very quickly, we probably need to put a line in your neck, but we, we will try to do everything to avoid that and create this blood vessel in the arm by joining two smaller blood vessels together to make a bigger one, because we can't use ordinary veins to do dialysis. They're just not big enough and it wouldn't work. Um, it doesn't need to be done every day, which is sometimes a big thing for some people. Um, People do tend to feel better if they have dialysis at least three times a week, and that's what people are offered if they go to a hospital unit. But people who dialyze at home usually do four to six treatments a week, and they usually feel better because the toxins aren't building up in between the dialysis sessions too much. The diet and fluid restrictions are usually become more strict when people start dialysis. Um, and often um, people tend to lose the ability to pass urine but people who've got polycystic kidneys, um, the, the, they don't see, they don't always see a big drop off in how much urine they pass. So while some people need to restrict their fluid intake quite strict, you know, quite heavily, you know, between 500 mils a day and a litre a day, um, people who still pass urine very well, even though they've been on dialysis, say six months, um, they, they don't need to uh, restrict their fluid intake if they can pass urine well. The other type of treatment you can see is peritoneal dialysis and there's a machine on the right which um, is a cyclical machine which people connect themselves up to at night and the machine will automatically put the fluid from the bags into the abdominal space which you can see here. Now obviously um, you know within the abdomen there's only a certain amount of room so if your kidneys were taking up a massive um, you know, massive amount of space here, there will be not as much space for the dialysis fluid. But basically, human bodies are programmed 
to make every, every compartment within them the same. And when we put the special dialysis fluid into the abdomen, the body thinks, oh, brilliant, this, this fluid is beautifully clean here. Um, we're drowning in toxins because the kidneys aren't working, so we'll shift a load of toxins into this fluid. And when they drain it out again, uh, in, a, you know, in an hour or a couple of hours' time, then all those toxins will go with it. Um, and that just means, and for, for that, instead of having needles, you have a tube uh, which is put in as a day case surgery. Uh, it's called a Tenkoff catheter, and people live with a tube in their abdomen um, until such time as they get transplanted. Um, Obviously, I've said before, if your polycystic kidney is very large, it's not always possible. It's usually done overnight whilst you're asleep. So it's pretty good for people who are working or, you know, people who have active social lives who like to get out and about a lot. Um, it's a daily removal of toxins and fluids. So it's a little bit more in tune with what the kidneys would do if they were really healthy. So it's getting, you know, daily removal of toxins. So you don't get these big jumps in the toxin levels in between dialysis sessions like you would if you were on hemodialysis. Preserves forearm veins for later because peritoneal dialysis is something that most people do for about five years, whereas the hemodialysis, you can stay on that for decades. Um, I've talked about the Tenkoff catheter, the, the way that we actually access, put the tube fluid in, um, but you do need some space at home. So if you live in a studio flat with no outside space, peritoneal dialysis possibly wouldn't be possible unless you were prepared to live with a load of boxes in your flat. Um, so, can I just, can I just with a question about home dialysis? Some, someone, yeah. Someone's raised the point that uh, the renal association is, is showing that around 6% sort of, of Preston's dialysis patients are on home dialysis, whereas mm -hmm. um, other hospitals are showing such great higher percentages. Yeah, yeah. For that. Um, it's a reason that it, we, we don't know, well, there's no one reason, um, but part of the reason we think is um, we, have, um, we, we are trying to promote home dialysis, which is obviously a big um, key goal of our team, um, but we do have a lot of satellite units um, because our patients um, it's a big cat it's a big area we cover we cover up to barrow in furnace in south cumbria um we have a lot more of our patients up and up north of lancaster who do home dialysis because our only renal unit is in kendall and if you live in barrow uh, you've got to travel to kendall now we are um hoping to build a unit in ulverston which cuts the journey times by about half um and that may well even make home dialysis even more um, of a challenge to persuade people because some people prefer to just come to hospital and have an expert do it. Um, we also have a lot, three units in East Lancashire um, who are they're just satellite units and one at Chorley. And, you know, a lot of people do find that if they've got a satellite unit within half an hour's travel to their home, they much prefer to do to come to hospital, even though ask any health professional who's involved in renal, you know, and look at the survival times and quality of life. Obviously, transplant's the best, but home dialysis is the next best, and then uh, hospital dialysis is the the, the least, um, you know, the least likely to give you a better quality of life um, than home dialysis. Yeah. And this person's asking, uh, explaining that they've got really poor veins uh, mm -hmm. as a result of chemotherapy. Would this right. really come out having a fistula? No, it doesn't. Um, but uh, obviously, it's sort of a fistula. There's uh, they usually don't the wrist or sometimes in the crook of your elbow. Um, and people go and see a vascular surgeon uh, to have a look at their veins. Um, usually they just do a Doppler ultrasound scan of the veins in the arms and they can see uh, a reasonably decent vein to join to an artery, um, which creates the fistula. We do see some people who need venograms, more detailed tests, where they put a little cannula in the arm and just put a little bit of dye in the arm. Now, people get nervous about that because x-ray dye is supposed to um, have a, you know, a negative effect on the kidney function. 
that usually we don't, that, that it's such a small amount that's used in a venogram. It, it helps us, it helps the surgeon to identify blood vessels far more accurately. So a small percentage of our patients might need that. We fistulas don't always work first time, uh, particularly if they're done at the wrist and you're diabetic, you, you've got more likelihood that it could fail because um, once the two blood vessels are joined together, there's always the risk that the blood might clot. And that means that you can't actually feel that buzzing pulse that you feel in a fistula that's working. Um, so yes, it's, it can be a little bit more challenging to get access for people who have had chemotherapy, but usually um, if you've had um, cannulas and things in the lower part of your arm, we might not be able to use do a fistula at the wrist, but we might be able to go high up and do it at the elbow. Uh, because you're sort of joining the blood vessels together higher up, um, they're usually a bit bigger. So it, it could just mean that they need a fistula called a brachial fistula above the elbow. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thanks, Anne. Yeah, we've, we're, we're, we're sort of very yeah. short time now. And yeah. uh... um, I mean, basically, it just, I mean, this is, we've gone through all this stuff, sort of stuff, really, but it's about knowing what your blood tests mean, keeping up with patient view. Keep keeping your appointments um, and, um, you know, just to say that social media is brilliant for finding out information, but um, sometimes it can also increase your anxiety. So use it sparingly sometimes. And obviously um, the most, the most reliable sources of information are things like the PKD charity, um, you know, kidney care website, that CKD health checks a really good booklet. Um, if you're not, if you're coming at it from a, you know, you, you don't really know much about medical jargon. Um, and remember, you know, loads of people react differently to, to medications, you know, uh, ibuprofen, I wouldn't ever use that. Uh, if you've got reduced kidney function, it's absolute poison for fragile kidneys. You know, you don't want to be taking ibuprofen or naproxen if you're having a flare up of, you, of your kidney pain related to cysts. You need something different because those really will um, affect your kidneys. They're, they're very toxic to kidneys. And if your kidneys are already struggling, you don't want to uh, give them more to do. Um, but there's an talk to your specialist, talk to your nurse, they can put people in touch with you, you know, you can put, put them in, put you in touch with people who've already been through things like dialysis or transplant, or maybe they're just a bit further down their treatment journey than you are, and talking to somebody else who's been through similar circumstances is, is, can be a massive help. And most renal units have clinical psychologists to talk about coping strategies, um, and, you know, there's lots and lots of help available. You just need to ask. And if you're struggling with side effects of a medication, don't just stop taking it. There's usually something else that will work as well and not give you the side effects. So just don't sort of say, oh, well, I've stopped take, taking that weeks ago because it was making me feel rubbish. Um, you know, stop it and then and, and, and tell us that you've stopped it and we can usually find something else. So... That's that's it, really. Thanks, Anne. There's a few few questions. Um, someone's here. Someone's asking how how long can you stay on dialysis? Uh, uh, not per session, but over over a period of time. You know, for for example, that if a transplant. Um, um, we we usually say peritoneal dialysis no longer than about five years because with the best will in the world, the fluid that we're putting in your tummy is not that body fluid and the peritoneum, the inner lining of the abdomen, which is you, which acts as the filter, uh, becomes less efficient. So most people need to swap to hemodialysis if they've not been transplanted within five years, um, if they're doing peritoneal dialysis to start with. Um, then obviously we we'd usually make a planned transition onto hemodialysis and put a fistula in your arm um, if you haven't been transplanted by then. Most people have been. Um, and obviously you're always going to be a kidney patient if you get to CKD four and five. Um, so you're usually going to um, hopefully be a transplant patient for far longer than you'd ever be a dialysis patient. But if you did say peritoneal dialysis for a few years, got transplanted or got transplanted first, um, and then obviously monitored very carefully for a number of years, decades. You know, we see a lot of people who, who've had a kidney transplant for 10 to 20 years and even longer than that. Um, 
you know, it, it's hemodialysis. People can be on for decades, decades and decades. Yeah. But obviously you've got to do the dialysis regularly. You've got to um, adhere to diet and fluid restrictions and medication. It's not just about just the dialysis. It's medication, diet, fluid restrictions and dialysis. So it's, a, it's you know, and transplant is obviously... Uh, you don't need dialysis, you don't need to make time for that, but there's still medication, there's still lots of appointments, you know, you are, you, you can't just dismiss a urine infection if you're a transplant patient, you have to ring your transplant nurse, you know, get some help, possibly get some antibiotics quicker than you would do if you weren't a transplant patient. Thanks, Anne. Another question about fistula, quick question about fistula. Uh, after yeah. transplant, does the fistula stay there forever? Um, are there, are there any it depends it depends some people's fistulas can be huge and unsightly which a lot of people get extremely anxious about before they have one uh, what i can say is that if you do buttonhole technique of needling uh, which a lot of people do if they're on home dialysis and some units are really trying to actually develop the technique of buttonhole it seems to stop these big um ballooning uh, aneurysms that you get on fistulas and um it, it's you know that the fistulas tend to be less problematic over time some people will have terrible problems with their fistulas others have a fistula that's fabulous for years and years and if it's not causing you any problems or discomfort or affecting the circulation to your hand if you've been transplanted some and it's very large it's achy it, it causes your arm to ache um which is very, you know, it's not the norm, it's the, it, things like that, but some people would have their fistula tied off surgically after a transplant if they wanted it. But um, we'd probably not do that routinely, we'd probably keep it there and you could just live with a fistula in your arm and, you know, um, if you ever need dialysis again, some people can use the same fistula. Thanks, Anne. One final question before we pass you over to our next speaker, before we move on to our next speaker. Uh, it's, it's a question about EGFR, someone that experienced a, a significant drop, drop in EGFR mm -hmm. following a severe bout of hypertension, and they're wondering whether that, could that, re, will that recover? Um, not always, um, but I think that, um, you know, for them, it would be obviously a, a case of monitoring blood pressure quite closely, maybe on a daily basis, um, sometimes maybe morning and evening. Um, and, you know, often, you know, we've got to remember that high blood pressure is um, also a massive cause of um, kidney disease. And if you do have existing kidney disease like polycystic kidneys um, and you, you, your blood pressure is not controlled, um, you do invariably run the risk of having um, you know, your kidney function drop off quickly. I would say that in the main, it might not, once the blood pressure stabilizes, um, you might live with a reduced GFR, but it would hopefully stabilize if your blood pressure stabilized. And as I say, if it's, you know, 30 down to 15, yes, that's a worry, but at 15%, you've still got a lot of kidney function left. Thanks, Sam. Okay. I think we, we are, we, I'm sure we could talk about this all day, I'm sure. And, I, yeah. and I'm sort of inclined to think we probably need to do a sort of a dedicated session with you. Um, there's lots and lots of questions, but I think we, we are going to have to leave it there. Um, no problem. Move on to, we're going to be a little bit late for starting lunch. We're going to move on to our next speaker, um, which is Susan. Um, but thank you very much. And I know you're much more comfortable uh, talking face to face. Yes. So, well, thanks for <laughs> coming out of your comfort zone yeah. and no giving up so much time um, to, to talking today. And we'll, we'll 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 talk to you again soon. And 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 to the audience, if there are questions that we 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 haven't answered today, I know it's difficult for us to get through them all. Please send your questions to info at pkdcharity.org.uk. And we will do our absolute very best uh, to come back to you. We can always get back in touch with Anne. I'm sure she'd be happy to. to yeah, answer and if, you, if you are on the call from, you know, Lancashire Teaching Hospitals patient, then feel free to get in touch with me. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Anne. Thank you. Okay. All thank right. You. Take care. Super. Bye.